In today's gospel we read, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. Go first and be reconciled to thy brother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The Pharisees, as was well known in the time of Christ, were a group of men who were very much attached to the externals of their religion. And they often, quite badly actually, interpreted the law in order to stick to their own traditions. Now, our blessed Lord in today's gospel is telling his listeners that now they must do better than the scribes and Pharisees. You must now fulfill the law in a more excellent and perfect manner. That is, he does not want us to be caught up in the mere externals. Oh, I show up to Mass just because I'm supposed to. As an example, our Lord gives to them in the Gospel, you have heard that it was said to them of old, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. You see, many of the people back then were under the false impression that the commandment, thou shalt not kill, forbade only the sin of murder, nothing more. And so our Lord was teaching his followers that actually any unjust anger is also forbidden. Angry words, blows, reproaches, these are all forbidden because, as moral theologians teach, these things lead by a very direct road to murder. Now, anger. If we think of anger as not a sin, but a passion that is put into man's, man's nature by God himself, it is in itself indifferent, neither good nor bad. It becomes good when you use it well and becomes sinful otherwise. For it to be virtuous, it must be done in due measure in order to make us, for example, brave against sin or to make us to be brave against our enemies, our true enemies. So soldiers to get angry in battle that would be a virtuous act. But anger is sinful when it includes in it a thirst or a desire for revenge, however small. When we wish harm for our neighbor's body or his possessions or his reputation. But it's interesting that the book of Psalms says be angry and sin not. That had always puzzled me. Be angry and sin not. Sounds a bit confusing, but it's not really. St. Gregory says, there is an anger which springs from zeal for righteousness. And as St. John Chrysostom further explains that there are times when we may be angry lawfully for example, he says, the father is angry with his child, but he is angry with his child because he cares for his child. But he who avenges himself is rashly angry, and he who corrects the faults of others is of all men the meekest. And he continues, for even God is angry, not to revenge himself, but to correct us. Let us imitate him. So to act is divine. Otherwise, it is human anger and sinful. So our Lord, thus far in the gospel, is condemning not the just anger, which is moderated by the virtue of meekness, 
and in due measure and for a just cause, but he is condemning that anger which includes any, even the least bit, of the thirst for revenge, be it internally or externally. He is correcting that false notion that the only thing forbidden by the law was the sin of murder. On a second note, the scribes, who are also mentioned at the beginning of the gospel, they used to teach that all sins were wiped away by sacrifices and offerings at the altar of God, even though nothing was ever done to correct the harm or the injury that was done to one's neighbor. This would be pretty much the same as going into the confessional and confessing that you stole, say, a thousand dollars and then expecting to be forgiven without any intention at all of restoring the money to its proper owner. So our Lord, to correct this idea, he says most beautifully in today's gospel, if thou offer thy gift at the altar, and there thou remember that thy brother hath anything against thee, leave there thy offering before the altar, and go first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then thou shalt offer thy gift. Those of you that have seen a, a solemn high mass or a pontifical solemn high mass, you notice that right before the communion of the celebrant, all the clergy, the deacon and the subdeacon, they come up to the priest or the bishop, and they sort of look give each other a liturgical hug, if you will, and they place their faces close together but not touching, and they say, the celebrant says, Pax tecum, peace be to thee, and the other responds, et cum spiritu tuo, and with thy spirit. It is done because before we consume the sacrifice, we must be reconciled. The new law, we know this, is a law of charity, a law of love. And it demands that before we offer sacrifice, that, and before receiving Holy Communion, we should be reconciled with our neighbor. That grudges held are given up, that arguments are settled and enmities resolved entirely and completely. And this law of Christ is meant for everyone, not only the laity, but the clergy themselves. And every one of us would do well to examine ourselves on these issues. Do you know who St. John the almsgiver is. He's not a well-known saint, but he sure has some great anecdotes in his life. He was known, well, first of all, he was a patriarch of Alexandria many centuries ago. He had a great love for the poor, but even more to the point, our saint, whenever he was injured by another person, he thought it was his greatest gain provided that he was not the cause of it. On one occasion, the governor of the city in which he lived, he imposed a new sort of tax law, which was very hurtful to the poor people. And St. John got up and he spoke in favor of the poor. The governor was so irate that he stood up immediately and stormed out of the, the room in a fit of anger. St. John had done nothing wrong. He was the injured party. But he was the one who made the first step towards smoothing things over. So later that day, when it was getting towards evening, he wrote a little note to the governor. You know, the sun is going to set. He did it to remind 
the governor of what the apostles said, let not the sun go down upon your anger. And this touched the heart of the governor so much that he immediately came back and apologized most sincerely to the saint. On a second occasion, St. John, the almsgiver, was trying all he could to restore peace between two men. One of them was a nobleman. They were terribly angry at each other, but he tried and tried to reconcile them, and he couldn't. Until one day, he invited one of the men to his private chapel to attend Holy Mass, and during the Mass, he asked him to recite along with him the Our Father. And the saint, he stopped at the petition, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he let the other man recite it alone. When the man had finished it, St. John turned around and he, and he commanded him to reflect on the words that he had just spoken to Almighty God. The man was so struck by this thought that he immediately forgave his enemy and was reconciled to him. And perhaps the finest example of this saint came about when he was once actually standing at the altar for mass, when he remembered all of a sudden that another clergyman had developed a very intense hatred for him. Again, it wasn't St. John's fault. He did nothing wrong, and certainly nothing to deserve being hated by a fellow cleric. Yet St. John did not wait for that man to approach him. He remembered, as he stood before the altar, our Lord's words. If thou offer thy gift at the altar, and there thou remember that thy brother hath anything against thee, leave there thy offering, and go first to be reconciled to thy brother. And so literally, he left the altar, found the cleric, begged his forgiveness, and the two were reconciled. And he bought, brought the clergyman back, and they finished the Mass together most joyfully. Because now, they could, in all honesty, say together those words, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I was thinking, today might be called Love of Neighbor Sunday, because in the Gospel, obviously, Christ speaks very seriously on the love of our neighbor by teaching that to hate one's brother is equivalent to murder and that the Father will not accept the sacrifice from one who nurses any grudge against another. And then, of course, St. Peter's beautiful epistle speaks of charity. It is as if our Lord wants to teach us today that he desires true charity to reign in our hearts, but we cannot love Christ unless we love every one of his members. One author puts it this way, the love of God and the love of our neighbor must run in parallel lines or else our charity is insincere at best. But I think I like the way the cure of ours puts it, very simply and much to the point. Here's what he says. All our virtues are mere illusions, and we ourselves are only hypocrites in the sight of God if we have not that universal charity for everyone, for the good and for the bad, for the poor and for the rich, and for all those who do us harm as much as those who do us good. But before closing the sermon, what should you do when anger begins to grow in your heart and threatens to destroy charity, what is to be done? 
Well, first, in every prayer that you say, at Mass and at the sacraments, ask the Sacred Heart for the graces you need. Those graces will always be given. Secondly, you must do your part. Join to this grace your own efforts. You might have to keep back an angry word. You might need to speak gently to one who has just injured you. Or perhaps you might have to not speak until the, your passion has lessened and you can speak calmly again. But don't, don't let it be an icy, cold silence. And thirdly and finally, keep in mind always the infinite patience of our Lord towards his creatures, those very creatures who tortured and killed him on Good Friday. Not only did he not once show anger, but he let, loved them even unto death. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.